Okay, so today, today we're very happy to have Andrew Law in person all the way from Memphis. He's going to tell us about quantum bit threads. Take it away. All right, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here in person. Um, first time in Vancouver, so near for the rest of the week. Looking forward to it. Today, I'm going to be talking about quantum bit threads. Uh, the context is holography and specifically hol holographic entanglement entropy. But seeing as I'm here for the first for the rest of the week, I thought I'd briefly mention some other work I've been work, uh, working on, just in case people want to discuss. So two other projects, um, also in holography. Most recently, I did a paper called uh, Island Mirages, where I found the tension between highly entangled bulk regions, uh, including islands and entry bounds. And I believe I found the first class of examples which explicitly violated the quantum booster bound. So I think that's interesting. And the other paper which I'm advertised is one I did with people at Amsterdam, including Ander Poor, the students, the postdocs, on the cost of holographic patterns, of course. And to summarize that one, uh, it generalizes holographic complexity to to something called cost, where if complexity is the shortest path between the two states, the length of that, then cost is the length of the general path. So it generalizes that story. And I talk about in that paper how, how it reduces the holographic complexity. But enough, enough about advertising those papers. Uh, to come back to quantum bit threads, uh, these kitty cats with their threads represent trilling as cats with, with, with threads. These quantum bit threads. Apologies for the bad joke. Um, so the one line summary of this talk is that I'll be giving a flow-based uh, formulation of holographic entanglement to be that's active to all orders in large n. Large n is the number of the element of value CFT. So if those words don't mean anything to you, don't worry, I'll, I'll explain it. Um, why are quantum bit threads interesting? Why, why even talk about this stuff? Well, holographic entanglement has been very important for the last 10 years. It's told us a lot about field theory, gravity, the connection between. And bit threads is a particular formulation of that, which has some conceptual advantages over surface-based descriptions, which I'll, which I'll introduce shortly. And why do we care about all orders in one over n? Well, a lot of the recent progress in the black hole information problem has has rested upon this all orders in one of n formulation. So if we understand that from the bit thread from the flow description, then we can get some new insights, see things from a from new perspective, and understand things like islands, black hole evaporation from that. So we can learn something new. Okay. So this is a monthly moment. So when you say what all orders in one of the n, the two of the response can not be two of the way that uh So just to set the scene, let me get some background uh, and some kind of big picture questions about entanglement and holography. So these are some questions which uh, we now have some answers to. Um, but these are kind of fundamental questions like where does the bulk space time emerge from in the field theory? Um, which states in those field theories are due to smooth non-stringy bulk space times? What determines the connectivity of the bulk space time? Um, does a superposition of bulk space bulk geometries make sense? And lastly, given access to only a subregion of the boundary theory, what exactly do I know about the bulk? What, what can I what can I determine? So that's just some big picture questions to say this. Okay. Now I'll come on to introducing um holographic entanglement entity, which is what I'll be filming upon in this talk. So the original prescription for holographic entanglement entity is this Rutakinagi prescription. Um, this disk here is a time slice of an asymptotically ADS space time. I want to calculate the entanglement entity of boundary region A. I consider all possible 
candidate butaconagra surfaces M, I calculate the area and then minimize over the set homologous to A, meaning I can smoothly deform from here to, to A. Okay. There's some caveats to this prescription. Firstly, it's UV divergent. So this area is, is infinite because of uh, going out towards the EDS boundary. And in the field theory, it's UV diversion because of uh, the UV degrees of freedom. So both sides need to regulate to get something finite. Uh, and in the bulk that corresponds to putting in a UV cutoff. Um, other caveats are that this is only valid for um, time reflection symmetric states. Uh, it's only it's an approximation that's only exact in the infinite large M and to have coupling limits. So there are numerous generalizations of this to finite N, finite lambda, and the covariant case. So this is the surface-based formulation of what I think that's going to be. So let me try and get rid of this stuff at the bottom. Yeah, good. So we need to introduce now the classical bit fits or flow based formulation of holographic entanglement to be. So, why consider that this? Well, there's some conceptual shortcomings to the surface based Utah and Aguilar description. Firstly, there's this issue with entanglement based transitions. So, if I have uh, an ADS boundary and a region A, which is disconnected. These are the mutaconaga surfaces. And as I bring these two together, there's a discontinuous jump in the RT surface. It goes from this to something like this. These two guys. So if RT surfaces are some do entanglement and some are somehow fundamental to entanglement, then it's kind of a bit conceptually odd that they should jump this continuously. So that kind of motivated the bit fair prescription. And what that prescription is, is again, this is, the, this is our asymptotic ADS disk. To calculate the entanglement entropy of boundary region A, we maximize the flux of a vector field V from that boundary region into the bulk. So as to start on A, go into the bulk. And it's subject to two constraints. We have the norm bound, V less than one over four G Newton, and that's the divergence less. So, um, what do the constraints do? This norm bound, in short, means that these threads, which are the integral curves of the vector field on V, can't get too close together. Okay, they can't overlap, they can't intersect. And the divergence constraint just means there's no sources and sinks for these threads. Okay, let me address some points. Um, the flux maximizing flow from A into its complement A bar is highly non unique. What's fixed is that the norm bound is saturated on this green dotted line, which is the RT surface, the Utakanagi surface. But away from that, it's highly non unique. Okay. Um, what are bit threads really? Well, conservatively, they're just a mathematical tool to calculate entanglement entropy. You can think of them as connecting up uh, bell pairs in a distillation of entanglement between A and its complement. That's one physical interpretation. Um, how seriously should we take a given field line, um, like this blue blue curve with the arrow? Not not especially. So I draw these. I'm, I'll be drawing a lot of these kind of diagrams, but it's kind of more for illustrative purposes. These threads have planking thickness, so V is really the fundamental thing. Um, I can think of like collections of bit threads, but not individual ones don't have too much physical meaning. And again, just as for the classical RT surface uh, description, this is only valid at infinite n, 
infinite turf coupling and time reflections matrix uh, states. So next I need to introduce uh, or explain another conceptual uh, issue which Bitbit help address, which is that quantum information inequalities, in particular strong subadditivity, uh, the kind of the derivation of this inequality from the RT surface prescription is not is not kind of manifest. So strong subadditivity, written in terms of uh, mutual information is this. So I is mutual information has a very clear physical meaning, and we'd like to see that from the bold picture. What the physical meaning is, is that if I have A and B, and I made B bigger, the correlation between A and B can only increase as I make B bigger. Now, from the surface perspective, this is this is kind of an outline of how, how the proof works. You take these party surfaces, you glue and cut them together. It's not clear at all what the heck this has to do with something very physical here. But from the bit there perspective, perspective, it's very clear and manifest what physically is going on. So this mutual information is given by the number of threads that can go from A to B union C. That's this left-hand guy. The right-hand guy is given by the number of threads that can go from A to B. Okay. And this inequality in this manifestation is just saying that the number of threads that can go from A to B C is greater than from A to B on its own. Okay, so that's one reason why bit bits are, are conceptually uh, advantageous to our, compared to RT surfaces, and it motivates why we need to consider the all the all orders in one over n generalization of that. Okay, so we'll be taking this bit third description, generalizing to all orders in one one over n. What's the surface? Based formula for that, well, that's the quantum extremal surface prescription. Um, uh, sorry, I have a question. to these guys. So again, we have a time slice of our asymptotically ADS space time. Everything's the same. M is our candidate entangling surface. Sigma is the bulk homology region for, for that M. And the prescription says that entanglement B is given by the minimization of this functional. So we had the area piece as before, but also a bulk entanglement entropy piece. And this is supposed to be uh, accurate to all orders in one over n, not, not empirically, but empirically. Uh, again, some, there's some caveats to this prescription. Um, we're going to be neglecting graviton fluctuations in the bulk. Uh, everything will be treated semi-classically. Um, in particular, we'll assume that the, the um, the bulk Hilbert space factorizes, which we wouldn't necessarily expect it to if you, if you account for gravitons. So we'll do this by taking the bulk uh, matter theory to have a large number of degrees of freedom. Um, there's also <laughs> regulator dependence in this guy. So the bulk entanglement entropy is UV, UV diversion, like entanglement entropy normally is. This G Newton is the bare coupling. Uh, Newton's constant. And the story is that the when you separate the counter term from this guy, it cancels the UV divergences in this to give you something finite and regulator independent. So these two terms are separately regulator dependent, but the sum, which is the generalized entropy, corn generalized entropy, is scheme independent. Okay, so this is what we're going to find a flow based description for. And that concludes my introduction. So any questions so far? Yeah, I, I guess I've always thought of like this all terms being just like the next leading order in one over expansion. If there's like more stuff that would like come out for it's a huge so we'll as a series. But so it's the S bulk is supposed to take care of all of that. All of that. So you might be thinking of like the F the Falkner Lukovic Manasena or FLM prescription, mm -hmm. which is just this guy. Then you add on the bulk entropy mm -hmm. afterwards. That that is just accurate to leading to subleading order in one over n. But this is supposed to be accurate to all orders. And this is what they use in these black hole information island business. And this is assuming this also assumes like the underlying theory is Einstein gravity, because like I guess you could also get other corrections 
like, if you have like higher higher coverage returns in your graph. Yeah. Right? So higher coverage terms. So are we just talking about flow prescription that's accurate to all orders and one over n, but also form coverage for correction terms? I wrote a paper on that a couple of years ago, and you account for these kind of stringy corrections with a with a with a norm bound that varies with 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 uh, position in space. Okay. But we're just going to be separating complications for now. Just so we're taking the turf coupling to be infinite. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. I have a okay. question. So let me uh, just flash the key messages of the talk, the messages that I want to convey and uh, show you in this talk. Uh, I'll, I'll give these again at the end. This is just a kind of a spoiler. Um, and it'll make sense, hopefully make more sense than in the talk. If it doesn't, then you know, I'll give you something. Okay. Um, first, is that we're going to give a flow based holographic entanglement position that's accurate to all orders and one over m, but still taking turf coupling to be infinite and time reflection symmetric uh, symmetry assumed. Second point is that the new, the key new qualitative difference between this quantum bit of description and the original classical one is that these bit bits can start and end at points in the bulk. That's the main qualitative difference. Third, is a new insight from this prescription on the islands. Um, what that is is that the boundary of islands are going to be bottlenecks uh, that are disconnected from the boundary, but they're still bottlenecks to the flow. And this is, is this is uh, this is possible because of the second point that these bit threads can start and end. And the fourth, it's a bit more speculative and a bit more hand wavy, is that these bit threads, in a sense, are going to be Planck scale and wormholes. So I'll see if I can convince you guys of that. Okay. So that takes me on to my warm up proposal, which I'm going to give you to kind of make the point of what does or doesn't work, what we do or do not want in a flow prescription. Um, this is an FLM, in quotation marks, bit third prescription, because it's sufficient to capture this uh, subleading correction one over large n, uh, which I was, which I was uh, mentioned when addressing uh, when addressing Aiden's question before. Uh, it's sufficient, and it's exactly the same as the classical prescription, except that we allow for a non-zero divergence in the bit thread uh, divergence. So we allow for some source function j of x, which I'll, I'll discuss. And this, because of this source term, these threads can start and end at points in the bulk. So I've kind of colored the, uh, the, the threads which end at points red, but it's, it's kind of, it's just, a, it's just color. It's not, it's not fundamental. And the constraint we need to put on the source is this, that the integral of j of x over the, the, the bulk monetary region for the RT surface, which is the screen dotted line, is equal to the bulk attachment entropy. So, loosely speaking, the physical idea is that we allow these bit threads to tunnel between bulk and tangled degrees of freedom. Um, this has a chance of capturing this bulk entropy piece of the holographic entropy proposal, this FLM formula. Because if we allow threads to, to tunnel across, to jump across this RT surface, we can get some extra flux from the boundary. So remember, we're maximizing flux. That's what gives us the entanglement entropy. Sorry. I'm buzzing too. Is that hurricane or something? Uh, it's emergency. Um, <laughs> where was I? So these extra threads are what captures this bonk entropy term. Um, sorry, can you repeat what the constraint on this? Right. Constraint is that the divergence of B is not zero anymore. It's now something non-zero is given by the source function, and that source function satisfies this guy. And then we only, sorry, what is sigma? Sigma, sorry, sigma is this region, is, is the bulk homology region for this green dotted line. There's everything below that, out to the boundary. 
So you still need an RT surface to define this. You still need to know, for this to work, you still need to. The previous, we said that the motivation for the bit press was that it's like a complementary description of entanglements that doesn't require RT surfaces. Exactly. Yeah. But here you do need RT. That's why this isn't a good proposal. That's why it's a warm proposal. I see. Uh, you need to get. I, I suppose you could formulate everything in terms of threads if you consider the first flow, consider two different flows. The first one should be divergence flows. This will tell you where the RT surface is supposed to sit. And yeah. then you define like a second flow, which obeys this, and that gives you the, the bulk attribute of RT. Yes, I think I tried. I think system um, yeah. that might work, but okay. again, you have to like give the RT surfaces yeah, so as input. Yeah. yeah, yeah it doesn't really work. It, maybe you could do something iterative or something to try and like, include that. But it would probably give you the one over n expansion. Yeah. That the bridge yeah. is getting based on the mm -hmm. but not the extremization over the one of the yeah. so, but, but these sources are located only in the entanglement wedge of A. That's uh, these sources J. Yeah. Uh, are they included in both the entanglement wedge? Well, you can, have a, you can have a source on the other side with the opposite. It must be a sink on the other side, right? It must so be a, a sink in the source, right? It should be a plus sign in the complement. Well, we don't actually we, we don't actually need. Um, this is getting a bit sidetracked because this isn't going to be the focus of the talk. But we don't need sources on this side to have this extra flux. I mean, we don't need these red threads on the other side. Oh yeah, fair. Enough. In that drawing, though, in, in, that in the drawing, yeah, in, we have in the choice of what you sign, Jamie. Yeah. yeah. Responsible. Okay, so this constraint on the source on, on the source comes from just a version theorem. Which says that the flux from A equals so the flux through A, which is this semicircle, is equal to the flux through the RT surface plus the integral of this divergence term over the bulk homology region. So that you just that gives you this in all its map here for them. So the Cephalon proposal is uh, was in 20 found by Frank Dazo and Cesar Gon, who published on the same day. Uh, the key difference between our papers is that uh, they don't have a description equivalent to the QES proposal. So they just have this FLM bit thread proposal. Um, so one shortcoming, as you mentioned, or as, you, as you noticed, was that we had to feed in the RT surface into the description. And bit threads are supposed to dynamically find the RT surface. The RT surface and its generalizations are supposed to be bottlenecks to the flow. You're not supposed to give them as input. Um, Okay, so yeah, what exactly do we want from a bit thread proposal that's accurate to all rules and one over n? Well, one, obviously. Two, we don't want any bottle surfaces in the formulation. So, uh, so that, that's, that's, that rules out the other the previous proposal. And to be a bit more specific, we want no more data about the bulk in the input of the description than the QS formula. So the QS formula knows about the bulk metric and knows about the entanglement to be whole bulk monetary regions for region A. So we want our description to, to not need any more input data than that. Okay. Um, which brings me on to the, uh, the start of the show, the quantum bit of proposal. What that is, is we're still maximizing the flux of a vector field V through A. So here's a base on the diagram to what I was doing before. We still have the norm bound, but now we have this modified divergence constraint. So uh, for all sigma, which is in this set uh, big omega of A, which is a set of all bulk homology regions for A, so it's a set of all such sigma like this. We apply this constraint on the flux of V in sigma. Okay. Um, what this means is that the, the flux, or the, the, uh, the number of threads that can end in any and all bonk homology regions is upper bounded by the, the entanglement speed. Of that region. So the larger entanglement speed, the more threads can end in that region. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Um, so regulator scheme dependence. Both of these constraints are separately regulator scheme dependent. So G Newton, this is the normalized G Newton, depends on the scheme. This bonk entropy term depends on the scheme. But the but this prescription taken as a whole is scheme independent. And you can show that uh, by proving it's equivalent to QES, which is in terms of generalized entropy, and generalized entropy is scheme independent. So that's one way of showing that. But it's true that the two constraints here are separately and independently scheme dependent. Andrew, just to make sure that I understand the, the logic here. So your the maximization is overall flows. Yeah. Uh, the choice of A is arbitrary, and the statement seems to be that for any choice of A, uh, the flow needs to satisfy these requirements. So you fix no fixing A. Well, you fix it. We want to calculate the entanglement field of a bit of boundary region A. Oh, A is a boundary region. Okay, yeah. Sorry, sorry. A is boundary region A. Yeah. A is complement. Yeah. Okay. Same. But 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 sorry. But the the flow needs to satisfy this constraint for any for all homology regions of A. All homology regions of A. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. Right. Yeah. Good. Thanks. You sorry. And and this is um. This is a static case and or like reflection centric case. So like we're not worrying about like a time dependent. Uh, Correct. Okay. And that would be important because it's not going to directly tell us about black hole evaporation and islands, but we won't just give it a few spoilers. We won't still be able to talk about islands. Um, and I'll discuss the covariant case at the end. But yes, assuming time reflection symmetry. Um, um, if you don't like this proposal, sorry, this, this constraint, um, you can also write it as follows uh, mu v mu to any down sigma is less than s general sigma. So, this is nice because it's regulator scheme independent. And it says that the flux of into any bond cohomology region, so cover all the flux into this guy, is bounded by the generalized entropy. So that's equivalent to this. Um, so there's no surfaces in this description. There's no there's no RT surface or, or QES. Um, we'll see that the quantum external surfaces are found dynamically. There's, there's still going to be uh, bottlenecks to the flux maximizing flow. Okay. And here, just and if, yeah. quick point up. So, if uh, you choose the particular homology region that's the entanglement wedge, yes. is this uh, important there saturated? Or, uh, yes. Yeah. We'll come to that. But, uh, yeah, that, 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 that includes my pros on here. Any questions on it? Next, I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about how to prove it's equivalent to, to the QS proposal. So, any 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 questions on this? So, as a first step towards proving equivalence to the quantum external surface description, we're going to consider uh, whether it passes some simple consistency checks. Okay. So the first thing we do is we consider the, the divergence theorem, which says that the flux through A, which is the thing we're trying to maximize, is given by this integrated divergence plus the flux through M, which is uh, an arbitrary uh, surface homologous to A. Okay. Now we have these constraints which implies that this first term, the sigma divergence of mu, is less than s bulk sigma. So, and that this second term must be less than um, the area of M over 40 Newton. So this follows from the norm bound. So V less than 1 over 40 Newton. 
and uh, it's saturated when V saturates this guy and when V mu is parallel to normal. So if this is your surface M, then um, this guy is going to be maximized when all the Vs are maximally packed, and all the bit are maximally packed on the surface and parallel to the normal. Okay, so the constraints give you this inequality. So the right-hand side, as we've said, is less than this term in brackets, which we can try and on the right-hand side, we just maximize. Um, so this, just from the divergence theorem and the constraints, we can see that the qubit, the, the quantum bit there prescription is less than, less than or equal to the quantum extremal surface prescription. The question is whether it's satisfied, whether this is saturated. Okay. And for this inequality to be saturated, as Lampos mentioned, we require these two to saturate these inequalities when M is the QES, the quantum extremal surface. Um, so, we require the threads to be maximally packed on the QES. The divergence constraint, this guy, to be saturated when sigma is the homology region for the QES. And we want the kind of continuation of, of the threads away from the QES to saturate the inequalities. So this is a hard thing to prove because you run into issues of of global constraints. Like you can do a local analysis around, around the QES, but if you don't know what's happening away from it, there could be bottlenecks elsewhere in the space time. Um, it's, a, it's a hard thing to prove in, in generality for all asymptotic BDS space times. Okay. But at least it's kind of, it's, it's on the right tracks. So to rigorously prove uh, equality or equivalence for the quantum extremal surface description, we need to use uh, a tool from convex optimization or Lagrangian duality. And in short, what Lagrangian duality does is it takes a, like a minimization problem and it turns it into an equivalent maximization problem. And it can do the reverse as well. In a bit more detail, there's three steps to, the, to this dualization. We start with a primal constrained optimization problem, such as maximize the flux in binary region A, blah, blah, blah. We apply Lagrange multipliers for the constraints, then we optimize over the original variables to get the dual problem. So this turns a minimization problem into a maximization problem in step three, or, or the reverse. And it's convex. It's convex optimization because the function needs to be convex. Now, here's a very basic example to illustrate uh, what we're doing here. So step one, we have this minimization problem, which I think even I can do, which is minimize x squared subject to x equals zero, zero. Uh, okay, step two, I'll add the Lagrange multiplier. That's this lambda here. So we have a min max and then uh, we have some theorems and convex optimization, which says when we can swap these two guys, when, when min max equals max min. If we swap them and then do the minimization over the original variables, as I said, you get this guy, which I can also check is, 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 a, is equivalent to this. Yeah. And the convex in this, in this particular setup is the x squared. x squared is a convex function. Okay, so that's the basic example of this procedure. Let me just outline how it works for quantum bit threads. So this is a lot, but let me just pick it apart. It's the same three steps that we did for primal with constraints, add the launch multipliers, then optimize over the original variables. Okay, here's the primal. It's our quantum bit there prescription, which is trying to show the equivalent QES prescription. So we're maximizing the flux of 
of V subject to the constraints. Um, so yeah, step two is add the Lagrange multipliers. So phi and mu are going to be the Lagrange multipliers. Now, this is a constraint that has to be satisfied at every point in the bonk slice. That's what this capital sigma is. So phi is a Lagrange multiplier at every point on, sig on capital sigma. And that kind of uh, enforces this constraint. And mu is a probability measure on bonk homology regions for A. Um, this chi is a characteristic function. So it's equals to one if x is in sigma, where so sigma is some monotony region, and zero otherwise. <clears throat> so this mu acts as the Gromish multiplier enforcing that constraint on the divergence of V that's like, that I gave in the, in the proposal. Then the hard part is showing that uh, this guy, if we, if we do the maximization with respect to the original variable, which is V, that's it lands on the QES position, which is this. So that's something that takes a couple of pages. I'm not going to go into the details, but this is the outline of the proof. How do you compose these constraints which are inequalities rather than equalities? Good question. So, these aren't, like, technically speaking, these aren't the Gorge multipliers. These are something called Kush, Counter, Tucker, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, uh, there's, there's an analogous thing to uh, the Lagrange multipliers for inequalities uh, as for equalities. Um, yeah. Any other questions? I kind of yeah, question. So if I'm in a in a special situation, maybe you're gonna talk about this later, but in a special situation, if I imagine that all of my bulk entanglement was due to what is sort of bipartite and due to like some little standard size black holes populating one region and the black holes are connected to each other behind horizons. Okay. So so I could have like at least certain types of entanglements. Uh, you could imagine that, that all the, the entanglement entropy is because of uh, because of it's a, these black holes that are entangled with each other. And, mm -hmm. and then in that case, kind of using the regular RT formula pretty much it gives you the same thing as the Quantum RT formula. Um, so, so you, you would just you could use the regular RT formula and say I need to
Uh, hello, hello. We can't hear the sound anymore. Good. Sorry. Uh, make sure you share your. your it's working. Oh, no. it's been... Good. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So the takeaway is that it's possible to prove that this bit for description is equivalent to QES. Okay, so uh, so now we'll look at the behavior of And here, the classical artist surface and the quantum material surface are going to be perfectly close. Um, that's what these purple and green lines are. Um, and this follows from the divergence constraint. And what this constraint implies for pure, pure bond states is that when, when, the, when the bond state is pure, this is zero. So this is uh, positive. Which says that the number of threads that can, that, that can end in the bulk has to be positive. So you can't have a net number of threads ending in bulk. So that's uh, here you've got two ending and two starting, so that's good. Something a bit more interesting is when you have this discontinuous jump in the quantum extremal surface, and that's something that. Jeff Pennington and others have shown important black hole evaporation. So, what's happened here? And how do we understand this from a different perspective? So, take, take the, the same setup and just crank up the bone contango entry. So, you can imagine these to be just EPR pairs, if you like, from here to here. And then, as we increase that bone entropy, um, we're allowed to have more and more threads that end in this bulk homology region, right? The number of threads that end below here is given by the bulk entropy. 
So as we crank up the end speed, more and more threads can go. And more and more threads can jump across the classical RT surface. But there's a limit to this. Like, if we keep on cranking up the end speed, and eventually a new bottleneck appears, this green dotted line, which is the QES, where the fold entanglement structure is such that these threads are forced to reappear in this point because of this constraint. Okay, so that's how this, this QES uh, jump is apparent in this quantum bit bit language. It's a it's kind of a new bottleneck to the flow coming from bonk entanglement. Um, so the, the quantum extremal surface is always going to be a bottleneck to the flow that follows from the norm bounds having to be saturated uh, on that QES, which is necessary to, to match the QES description. How do we understand, how do you understand islands from the quantum bit description? So here we have two entangled CFTs, CFT left, CFT right. Um, their bulks are disconnected. So if we want to maximize the flux from left to right, we only do it by jumping from one to the other via our constraint. And by the constraint, um, the number of threads that can end on this left hand side is given by the bonk entropy. So as we crank up the entropy, more and more threads can jump across. Okay, that bulk uh, entanglement, or if the bulk here is cured by the bulk by the bulk over here, then by the constraint, these threads have to reappear over this side. And what happens is that again, we get a new kind of emergent bottleneck appear into the, to the flow. Um, so that gives you this interpretation that boundary of islands are just emergent bottlenecks to the quantum bit bit flow. So a uh, nice aspect of bit bits is that uh, these islands are not really appearing discontinuously, like they are, like they are in the surface description. Like in, the, in the surface, QES description, as you crank up the entanglement in the bulk, these ions just switch off, right? But here, we always have bit threads going from here, from the left to the right. But as you, as you crank up this bulk entanglement, we reach a point where the start to get stuck in this, in this right hand region. And the island boundary is, is just the bottleneck, and the island is just a region in this right hand bulk, which is highly entangled in the left hand bulk. Um, so I say this as islands. Um, that kind of implies that I've had this, this quantum bit bit description and tap on black hole evaporation. Um, but as I've said, I'm assuming time reflection symmetric cases, so, so not really. That said, again, there are islands in time reflection symmetric setups. So this is this is a real thing. You can you can show this in some uh, models, uh, like in this islands outside the out the outside the horizon uh, setup in two D change gravity. Um, how am I doing on time, Laura? Uh, it's two twenty five. We'll be we started a bit late. Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Okay. So. Here I'm going to explain in what sense bit beds are flanking wormholes. In this picture, we have three pairs of entangled CFTs. Well, this one's not actually entangled, but three pairs of CFTs with different amounts of entanglement between them. They're all in the thermofield double state, just at different entanglement temperatures. So this one on the left is at T equals zero. So it's just a product state of the vacuums. And the bolts are disconnected. There's no there's no bulk entanglement in this one. This one, we've uh, we're, we're still below the black hole threshold, um, so we have some bulk entanglement, but it's just like a thermal gas in each one of these, purified in one bulk with respect to the other. And here we've cranked up the entanglement temperature in the thermal field level state above the black hole threshold, 
So now these full space times are, are, are connected by a nice angles and bridge. Okay. What happens in these three setups with, with, with the with the, uh, the bit threads? So again, the divergence constraint says that the number of bits that can end in the bulk homology region for A. So that's, for example, this entire slice here is given by the bulk entry. And it's zero in this case, so no threads can, can jump from here to here. So we, we correctly get that the entanglement between A is zero. Here we have order one bulk entropy, and these threads can end at points in here and jump over. And here, um, we've got uh, a connected geometry, so these threads can uh, can can think of maybe jumping across like an order n squared number of them, or you can just think of them as just going through without. Uh, without divergence constraint, um, with, with divergence from zero. Um, so I've drawn kind of dotted lines drawing these bulk uh, entanglement points. You probably shouldn't take the toast so seriously. I'm, I'm drawing them to suggest the idea that these quantum bit threads are like flanking wormholes, which if you get order n squared of them together, they condense to form this classically connected space time. So, this is a manifestation of ER and ZPR. Okay, Planck, these uh, quantum bit bits are microscopic wormholes. And, the, and I'm arguing from this kind of uh, chain of logic. Um, yeah, any, any questions? Any questions in that? Um, the last thing before I conclude is discussing bit threads and homology. So the nice thing about this setup is that the behavior of quantum bit threads follows from the behavior of the classical bit threads in the higher dimension picture. So here I've got the usual picture, but now we're assuming that the, the bulk CFT in the setup is itself holographic. So there's a higher dimensional picture, which is this guy. So this disc here is the upper disc here. Okay. And we've got some end of the world grain here. Now, as you, as you can see, uh, we've got the threads which uh, disappear or have, have sinks in this picture. Can be interpreted as disappearing into the higher dimensional bulk in the W holographic model. Okay, so that's a nice uh, kind of interpretation of that in these particular models. Um, I'll skip that particular bound. And this is an example. Of a W holographic model with islands. So uh, here we have uh, two kind of quantum dots, or you can think of them as, uh, as uh, something going into the board, but A and its complement A bar. Um, and here's the kind of asymptotic radius uh, setup. And here's the higher dimensional bulk. So, because we're in double topology holographic setup and in the higher dimensional picture, everything's classical, these bit threads don't have any non zero diversions. So, you can kind of see what's happening from, from the quantum bit threads. Um, so, this green dotted line is the classical RT surface. It's going from this ADS bulk onto this end of the world brain. So the entanglement wedge for A in the intermediate picture is this boundary, meaning this guy, the island. And what's happening from the highest dimensional perspective 
is that we're trying to maximize the flux from A to F bar. So some of them can go through this ABS kind of bonk. Some of them can go into that high dimensional picture and they come out on the brain into the island. And then just like in the previous slide, uh, the boundary of the islands is kind of an emerging bottleneck to the flow. So, so many threads try to go from here to here like by doing this thing that they get stuck here. That's what the island is in this setup. Okay. Um, that's all I want to say about the WHO graphic picture. Uh, there are some unresolved questions in future directions, some of which are kind of current work in progress. First is that is the question of are there alternative equivalent proposals? So I've given one proposal here, which I've shown is equivalent to uh, the QES proposal, so total orders in one over n, but that doesn't mean there's not going to be other proposals. Um, I've assumed time reflection sy sy uh, symmetry. Um, so it's an open problem to covalentize this. Uh, I think it's particularly interesting to consider threads which don't move in a spatial uh, kind of direction, but move in a timeline direction. Um, so that's something that Matt Edrick and Ronak Rubini have looked at recently. So combining their work with my work on this, on this quantum uh, generalization is important. Um, I think this is this could have something to say about uh, DS entanglement and cosmology. So some people have looked at uh, bit threads and entanglement in in the CISA, for example. Um, here's the CISA. And they consider flows from this horizon into the bulk. But at least if you believe in kind of DS CFT, then the boundary theory is that future and past infinity. Here and here. So the natural place for the flow is from the past to the future. Like this. So if we can if we can get the variant quantum bit that goes on, try and apply it to the sitter, see whether it makes sense, see whether it captures things like the, the sitter entropy, then we're halfway there to understanding entanglement in the sitter, and possibly learning something about the uh, non gravitational dual. And lastly, we should kind of think a bit more carefully about how seriously we can take this, this uh, hang weavy thing I said that quantum bit plates are plankton wormholes, that they're a kind of manifestation of the ER equals EPR, um, and whether we can think of space time, old space time as being kind of knitted, so it could be a bit poetic from these bit plates. So these threads can kind of start and end the points in the bulk. You can think of continuous threads as actually being stopping the starting on the flow. And you can think of the whole bulk space time itself as just being saturated with these threads. And that's what fills up the space time. That's getting a bit kind of speculative, but this is something I'd like to emphasize. To, to your turn, configuration depends on which region or I mean, even back in the original situation. Yeah. You don't have a single bit thread configuration that would calculate all of the entanglement entropy. So it's no. not really like you have a state and a canonical bit thread configuration. Right. So maybe perhaps the set of all flux maximizing configurations all boundary solutions. Uh -huh. The and collection of these things. Yeah. Okay. Um, and let me end by flashing key messages again. I'll be speaking about uh, each of the cats. And yeah, thank you for listening. Okay. Any questions for Andrew? It's just a more general question, sort of related to the last time there's all about you to point out. Um, has there been any work uh, towards trying to justify the bit thread slash quantum bit thread proposal from a more microscopic point of view. Um, and I mean, you know, the um, often these type of systemization problems find their 
quantum mechanical origins you can plot little formulation uh, where you kind of sample the role of different configurations and the extreme is the saddle point and that's how it's picked out has there been any sort of general work of trying to see how like trying to map this different picture which is a good language for capturing the behavior of minimal surfaces uh trying to map it to some sort of uh to connect it with the microscopics more directly all right so yeah these these uh, qes and artist surface prescriptions have derivations uh which is a nucleus matters yeah. and from, from that that's what you're referring to right uh question is whether something like that can be done with bits you know from more kind of bottom up so yeah, yeah, bottom or top down i guess so uh i don't know yeah i don't know it's an interesting question I just to make a comment like the way that you were suggesting what you're asking what you there's that like I guess and, yeah like I don't know how much you want this but you know enough to go like what sort of configuration is possible certainly you have to like specify like, uh, that like, if you if you have like a vector field you're running into like the region of space in this case you know it imagine designing the coordinate chart that region which is based on like Geodesic parameter along that field, and then geodesic deviation is the transverse direction between the adjacent to adjacent threads or adjacent to the line of this field. And that's probably enough. To, there is enough, there is an amount of information that will be enough to you know, get some mechanical. Yeah, yeah, some, if you assume the flow is, is, is formed from geodesics, and, so, and then you can learn about the form geometry. But it really was kind of Getting towards with this last point is this uh, picture here, where you have this kind of condensation from order one bit bits to order n squared, and that gives you uh, somehow gives you this connected form space time. So this this ER bridge is in a sense knitted from these quantum bit bits. So that, that's that's more the kind of sense I was going for with that comment. But yeah, this is. Uh, a new size currently. Does uh, you mentioned the strong subjectivity group? Does that clear when you have the quantum extremal surface? Yeah. Proposal the quantum bridge proposal. This this goes through or uh, it's, it's non trivial, uh, but yeah, in the appendix I proved uh, something called nesting, which itself implies strong subjectivity. Okay. And which itself implies so relativity, lack of qualities. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yes, yes, I, you can prove. There's not quite as obvious. You can prove it. There are no other questions. Let's thank Andrew a bit. Bravo.